Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 14, in one voice, let's read. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus <clears throat> by God's will, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens and in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him, predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ, as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. In him you were also you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Please be seated. Father, I thank you for allowing us to start the series on Book of Ephesians. I pray that as we dive into your word, that we would dig deep and find the treasure, the truth that you have revealed to us in the Bible, Lord God. I pray that we will cherish what we find and help us to be transformed through your word. I thank you and I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So today we are starting an expository sermon series from the book of Ephesians. You all got the, the little flyer, right, with the sermon plan on it. Go ahead and raise it up. Keep, don't throw it away. Keep that. No, not that one. The one with the blue paper. Yeah. Okay. It's on the table in the back. If you haven't received it on the way back, on the way out, pick one up. Um, so it's got, uh, it's a chart of all the sermons that I'm going to be doing in the book of Ephesians. Okay. Um, the sermon, the, the series is called The News, okay? Uh, we're going to talk about all the, the new things, all the things that are new because of God. Okay, so you, you will know this is going to be a new story, new authority, new, you know, everything about what is new when we are in Jesus Christ. Okay. So the book of Ephesians was written by none other than Apostle Paul in the year A.D. 60 or 62, uh, and around a similar time, maybe a couple years earlier than Book of James. We studied Book of James for 15 weeks, right? Um, so, and there's a lot more to the background of this book, but I'm going to unfold it to you as the series goes on. Uh, but when we study through the Book of Ephesians, we, we're going to find out that there wasn't any a church specific problems that, that, that he was dealing with. Like book of James, there was a whole bunch of problems, right? And he's like telling them and teaching them, rebuking them and all this stuff. Uh, in Ephesians, it's not the case. It's more of a general teaching of God, his plan, and when he comes into our lives, when we experience the glory of God in our lives, how our lives would change um, yeah, so as God unfolds His new plan in us, His new story, uh, it should affect every part of our lives, in, not only individually, but relationally, us and everybody else. So if this is the grace of God, if this is the grace of God that we have experienced, then this is how we must be transformed too. So the big idea today is uh, God's grand plan was accomplished in Jesus. God's grand plan was accomplished in Jesus. Uh, so many people outside, outside the church, they criticize us, 
right? You have heard this say, people saying or criticizing us. Um, and so many people within the church, as they grow older, even the adults, at some point, unfortunately, leave the church, despite growing up in the church. Many of you, unfortunately, uh, if going, going by this trend, or the statistics say, many of you will not remain in the church. I'm praying that that's not the case for KCQ and for our future generation, but that has been the statistics. So many people suspect different reasons. Oh, man, the church is too boring. Church is too old-fashioned. Um, church is uh, too ex exclusive uh, in its teaching. But however, the most often raised issues is not because the church is too uh, different than the world, but the issue is the church is not different enough. The main issues that people raise who criticize church is because the church looks pretty much the same as the world in our morals, in our conducts. We don't stand out enough. We don't act different enough. And that is why we are criticized. Church, modern day church, has reduced this beautiful thing called Christianity down to, I've used this phrase before, moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. Do good, feel good religion. Be a good person, be a happy person, and believe in God, whoever that God may be. My friends, there is way, way more to Christianity than what meets the eyes on Sunday morning at 11. We're talking about eternity past, eternity future. As the words we have read in the in book of Ephesians, before the foundation of the world kind of stuff. We're talking about this cosmic level, universal warfare kind of stuff. We're talking about like, you know, uh, Star Wars and Avengers Endgame and Lord of the Rings all put, put together and we're living right in it but we treat it like it's a 20 minute sitcom slap through it uh, light heartedly so it is my desire to offer all of us to know more and know thoroughly of what Christianity is all about it all starts with God and his plan his master plan that he accomplished in Jesus Christ. First, he chose us. God chose us in Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 4 to 5 says this, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. This is, uh, verse 4 is the Genesis, book of Genesis kind of language. In the beginning, God created. Before the foundation of the world. Before this material world was ever created. Okay. Things cannot just come into existence. Right? Everything that begins, that begins to exist has a cause. This is not an idea, but it's, we confirm this in our everyday lives. We never see anything just pop up into existence without someone making it. That is our everyday experience. The world at some point began to exist. And the Bible says this beginning point is when God spoke the world into existence. Existence. God Himself is the cause. And even before He did that, even before He created this world, He chose us. He thought about us. Mind boggling to think, right? He didn't create the world and He looked at Him like, I kind of, it's missing something, scratching His head. Maybe I'll put somebody with four, uh, two arms and two legs, kind of looks like me. He didn't do that. 
He created the world specifically for us. And he put rest of the creation under the dominion of mankind. We are to rule over the universe, not universe, you rule over the created universe. That's why idolatry of any kind is a huge offense to God. Because when we elevate these mere creatures, whatever it is, today for us we have money and maybe fame, if we elevate those things, mere just things above us and even in the place of God, when God himself is a creator of all things, that itself is a huge offense to him. My number two, Joel has a, a BTS action figure. I don't know which one, I don't know which one it is. He's got this like pink hair, whatever, right? It's like as if she looks at this BTS action figure and starts calling it dad and then listens, tries to listen, figure out what this doll is trying to say, tell her and then obey whatever it says, okay? That will be absurd. It's an example. So for instance, it's not real, <laughs> okay? It, it, that will be absurd, right? And I will be very, very offended, right? It's absurd. It's stupid. It's crazy. That doesn't happen. But idolatry is just like that. We're looking at these things that were created by God. They're below us, and we're worshiping it as if it's God. God created us. By his omniscience, he already knew us. And he chose us in Jesus Christ to be holy and blameless in love before him. This is a mystery, guys. We don't fully understand omniscience. That means, that means all knowing. We don't fully understand this. We cannot fathom the extent of God's knowledge. We, when we hear words like predestination or chosen people, it just baffles our mind and we have all these questions about how it works. And, this, and if people try to attempt to answer that, it just brings more confusion at times. Okay. But can we just stop and marvel at this for a moment? If God spills to us all of his knowledge, it will be just too much for us. It might just kill us. Our little brain cannot contain all of God's knowledge he gave us just enough for us to be saved, just enough for us to get to know Him and to love Him, just enough to understand His love for us. Even the Bible itself is just too much for us to understand. Pastors study all their lives. And people arrogantly speak against God because they cannot understand Him. People resort to science and philosophy and try to contain God in a, in, in inside their little own box. And if God can be explained and He can be contained inside our box, is He a real God that is worthy of our praise? If we can explain God, is He worthy of our worship? Is, can He even save us? Can He even save us from our sins? This God that we're trying to put inside of our box. He cannot. My friends, God is to be worshipped. And because of His greatness, we should, you know, we, we should read words that sometimes we cannot fully understand. We, we should read the Bible and even though we can't understand it, we should stop and just praise Him and thank Him. Because this God, this unfathomable, indescribable, incalculable God chose us in Jesus Christ. This unknowable God made himself known to us. And he came near to us. He adopted us and we, you know, we were his creation. So he could have treated us like any other things that he created in this world. It could be like, a, you know, he could have treated us like a tree, a rock, Maybe a, a rat in New York subway. But he adopted us, specifically us, 
to mankind as his children, as one of his own. Friends, it's not, it cannot get any better than this, but it does. Keep listening, guys. Next, he, he, God redeemed us in Jesus. God redeemed us in Jesus. Verse 7 and 8 says this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, that He richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. So in order for Him to make us His own, He had to purchase us. He had to buy us. He had to redeem us. Uh, shortly after I graduated from college, uh, I, I started working at the, uh, the, at the clothing store, just kind of in between my, between my first job, official job as after college. Um, you know, I worked at a clothing store, and uh, I don't know if they still do this nowadays or not, but uh, back then we had this thing called layaway. Okay, I don't know if it's a term familiar to you or not. Layaway is like this. Um, if somebody comes in, it's so like a guy comes in, he wants a jacket, okay? And the jacket is too expensive. But he doesn't, wanna, he doesn't want it to be sold to somebody else. He wants to buy it. So he will put down uh, like uh, a deposit of 30% or something. And then he'll come periodically as he gets paid and, and, you know, and as he makes money, he will put down towards the, the price of the jacket. And then once he's paid the, the price of the jacket in full, he can redeem the layaway. He can, buy, he can buy it. It's his. But when he puts down the deposit, we would take it off the floor because he bought it. It's his. He just can't take it yet. So we, we put it in the back, put his name on it, and then every time he comes in, you know, he wants to go and see the jacket. He wants to try it on again to make sure he wants it. You know, he does it. And eventually, when the, after the final payment, it's his. He redeemed the layaway. God redeemed us. And the, the purchasing price was the blood of Jesus Christ. Not just a few drops. Not just the back bowl, like 200 milliliter that you give to blood drive. But every ounce of his blood was shed to purchase and redeem us. And he didn't begrudgingly do this, okay? He did it, as the Bible says, according to the riches of his grace. You guys remember the, the acronym that Pastor B used? It's a very popular acronym. Grace is this. Grace is what? God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. We enjoy all the riches of his blessings, salvation, and, and everything else that comes along with it because Jesus paid for it. He gladly took the beating. He gladly took the flogging and being driven on the cross through, with nails. If the jacket was worth like $1,000, then the payment required to buy the jacket is $1,000. If you pay any less, you cannot redeem the jacket. If the payment required to purchase us, it had to be enough to cover the cost. The cost of our sins was life. And that's what Jesus paid with his life for ours. He received the punishment of our sins. He was beaten his skins and muscle all torn apart, hung on the cross with nail, being driven through his hands and his feet. That was the cost. And next is he gave us an inheritance in Jesus. He gave us an inheritance in Jesus. That's number, point number three. He gave us an inheritance in Jesus. Verse 11 and 12 says this, In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. Amen. So I told you it gets better. 
right? It, 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 the, here it is. We have received an inheritance. What's an inheritance? Uh, I've used this illustration a couple times, but it's a different, there's a twist to this. Jeff Bezos, you guys know who that is, right? So he used to be the most, uh, he, the richest person in the world. Now it's Elon Musk, but he's like trailing right behind him, okay? But let's say he's like, he's still the, the richest person in the world, okay? Um, and you know that he has an adopted daughter from China, right? So this girl, she went from, you know, she was an orphan in China, which means she is one of the most marginalized person in the world. Like they wouldn't care if she died, kind of marginalization. And she became, went from that to a child of, adopted as a child of the richest person in the world. And on top of this, as a Bezos, she, um, we don't know her name, by the way, um, this adopted child, girl, uh, she is part of the Bezos fortune. She's going to receive a portion of Bezos inheritance okay so not only her life went from a an orphan who could just die the next day and people didn't care to a child of the most the richest person in the world and not only that it gets better not only that he or she will be is going to be part of the inheritance receiving a portion of all the riches jeff bezos had when God adopts us as his children, we not only have the status change from a sinner to a child of God, but we're, we're part of his heavenly inheritance. Uh, you know, when we, when we get these marketing calls, I get, I get them a lot, and, you know, or ads online that says, like, oh, free vacation or free phones or free whatever, right? Congratulations, you just have one free iPhone 14 and it hasn't even come out yet. Okay. We automatically think this must be a scam. No, hopefully nobody thinks it's real, right? <laughs> Don't fall into it. It's a scam. Nothing, cause there's nothing free. Who gives away free $1,000 phone? Who gives away free $5,000 vacation package? Nobody does that. What's the catch? And what is it going to cost me? We always think that. But what God has done for us, choosing us, adopting us, redeeming us from our sins, and giving us the inheritance, didn't cost us anything. Verse 12 says, So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to His glory. What God wants, and it's going to, inevitably result in it's a response to his amazing gift that costed us nothing but costed Jesus everything our response is praise to his glory the songs that we sing on Sunday the song that we just sang today your glory should be an expression of gratitude do you really put your hope in Jesus? Do you really believe that there is no hope outside of Jesus to receive salvation and redemption? If so, then every time you realize this, every time that comes to your mind, praise must come out of your mouth. Praise should be in your mouth daily because every day, is another day, is another reminder of what God has done in our lives. Okay. Nowadays, we can stream everything, all the songs that we want to hear. I, I, you know, I have free subscription to Apple, Apple Music for six months, so I've been kind of indulging in our, my uh, songs of my childhood. Um, at the same time, I can listen to all the praise songs that I want to hear when I'm meditating, when I'm... When I'm just, you know, 
uh, relaxing, or even when I'm like studying, I, I'm listening to praise songs, remind, con con constantly reminding me that my life was purchased by the blood of Jesus. And as a response, praise of glory from my lips. I don't know what songs you guys listen to daily, on a daily basis, but I hope it's not all secular songs. I'm not trying drawing a line here, but if you are to praise God for the redemption that He's given to us, why wouldn't you listen to songs that express who we are? Why wouldn't we listen to songs and sing songs that represents and reminds us of what God has done for us? Next, my final point today is God sealed us in Jesus. God sealed us in Jesus. Verse 13 and 14 says, In Him you are also sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of His glory. The word sealed was used uh, when you certify like documents, okay? Let's say you, you have a, like a college students when you, um, when you get a transcript from, from high school, when, it's, when they send it to the colleges, they seal it. They put like a little seal on it. It's, a, it's either a stamp, but officially they're supposed to put like a embossed seal. You know what that is? It's like a little um, device that clamps the paper and makes this like a marking on the paper so you can't like duplicate it. Okay, sealed, it's official. It's done, unchangeable, unnegotiable, immutable. So how this process works is, it's nothing short of mystery, okay? Um, God would use agents like, like you and me, like Apostle Paul or James, Peter, to speak the words of truth. What you're hearing this morning is not just Pastor BJ blabbering about something, but it's the truth of God being preached to you, to your souls. Gospel of salvation, declaration of God's redeeming grace, the only hope in Jesus to be annulled of our trespasses, to cancel our debt of sin. The only way for our eternal destiny to change from hell to heaven. So when this truth is spoken by God's agents, like a secret FBI, not so secret, but, but those who hear it will either believe it or reject it. The ones who receive it and believe it, the gospel is your salvation. The gospel is talking about you. And if you reject it, then it's not for you. Then you are left to pay for your own sins with your life. And the, the fact that the Holy Spirit is with us, the residency of the Holy Spirit, it, it, that's a seal, that's the proof. That's a stamp of approval, saying, and that's why if you believe in Jesus and have the, have the kind of that kind of faith that saves, uh, I'm borrowing the words from James here, right? If you have the kind of faith that saves, you cannot but to progress to change. Because Holy Spirit is not going to let you be. He's going to live in you and work with you. So when you hear the Word of God, the Holy Spirit inside us causes us to respond in faith and obedience, however imperfect that might look. You see that? When we hear the Word of God, Holy Spirit, who is the seal of our faith, causes us to respond in faith and obedience however imperfect that might look. That's why 
we learn through the 15 weeks of book of James that saving faith produces work. The Holy Spirit is a down payment of our inheritance. The, the layaway illustration, okay, the down payment, the 30% that you have to pay, once you put the down payment, it's yours. The jacket is yours. The Holy Spirit is the down payment when God claimed us as His. God purchased us with Jesus and put, down, put a down payment for us with the Holy Spirit. When the days on this earth is over, one thing that we know for sure, and I can prophesy to you, that is that we will all die one day. It could be tomorrow. It could be after 30, 40 years, or maybe a little longer. You guys probably have more. Okay. I can guarantee you we will all die. And we will stand before God and before the judgment throne. When we die, those of us who have the seal of approval, those of us who are sealed with the Holy Spirit, we're going to be experiencing the fullness of God's glory. And the Holy Spirit is guarantee of our salvation. Uh, so in 2006, uh, a week before I opened my shoe store, uh, I went to Detroit. I was in Indiana. I, that's where I opened my store. And I went to Detroit uh, to be trained on how to sell shoes, okay, how to manage a store. And uh, Nike was nice enough to give me a baseball ticket, right? And one of the, the during the training, I, I, he gave me, the, Nike gave me two tickets. And so I, I took one of the guys who, was, who I was being trained with. And we were there watching the game. It was Detroit Tigers versus St. Louis Cardinals. And, you know, I'm not much of a baseball guy. I'm actually not at all a baseball guy, okay? Uh, but I went there because it was free. Never done it before, so I wanted to go watch, you know, kind of experience it for myself for the first time. And it wasn't fun, okay? It was, it was cold. Detroit in October was really, really cold. It snowed in the middle of the game. Uh, hot dog was so expensive, I was, like, upset at the price of the hot dog. Like eight bucks, okay? So I'm like miserable, cold. I don't even know what's going on. Like I don't even know anybody that's playing, all right? And so, so I was just sitting there, and it was like, ah, yeah, eighth inning just finished, and we're like, we gotta, I wanna, I wanna go. All right, the, the game's not even finished. Like if we go and the game is over, we're gonna hit the traffic. All these people are now walking out, forty thousand people. So we don't wanna, we don't want that. So let's just go home. So we left at uh, eighth inning left the game. All right, so time passed, whatever. A few years later, uh, I met somebody, a friend of mine, uh, and we're just talking about our hobbies and things like that. We're just kind of getting, getting to know each other. And he said, oh, I'm a baseball fan. And he told me that St. Louis Cardinals was his favorite team. Like he knows everything about the team. All the players, the history of the franchise, all the players, the each, per, each player's high school the team, everything. He knew everything about St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, just a few years ago, I was in uh, Detroit watching a Tigers game against your team. He was like, when was that? Uh, October or so? He just dropped. Oh, I, I told him, like, before that, I was like, yeah, but I know it's kind of boring. So I left in the eighth inning. And he's just like, he, his jaw dropped. I'm like, BJ, that was the World Series. The tickets cost thousands of dollars. And you can't even get them if, if you have money. You can't even get it. It's the World Series. Baseball fans, even if they wanted to, they can't go. You were there, and you left in the eighth inning? I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's, he would have liked it because his team lost that day. So that was a World Series year 2006. If you can look it up. Um, game two, 
uh, Tigers versus Cardinals. Tigers won. It's the only game Tigers won. Anyway, so, you know, the tickets cost thousands of dollars, and if, you know, you can't even get in. Just, you can't buy the ticket. It's not available. Right? I was there, and I was like, it was a good seat, too. I, I was really close to the field. Like, Nike, like, hooked me up. Okay? So, a lot of times, that's how we treat Christianity. You sit there, disinterested, because you don't fully grasp the gravity of this truth. You don't want to be here. It's inconvenient for you to be here. It's uncomfortable. You think about your homework, your friends, what you want to do after church, and you don't want to be here. But if you really know what it is, if you really understand what it costs it for, you, for God for you to become His, then you wouldn't just sit there waiting for it to be over. But you would truly, truly worship God. You can't wait for the worship to start. Praise God with, with thankfulness and gratitude of the redemption purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, if it was my friend who, who, went, who was at the game, who, who went to the game instead of me, then he would have loved it. The time of his life, just shouting and you know, just screaming and yelling at the referee or umpire, umpire, is that what they call it? Yeah. Yelling at the umpires, you know, he would have a good time. He would know every player playing. He would know the stats. He would know what the coach is thinking. He would know because he studies Cardinals. Where are you guys today in worship? If you are a believer today, yet lost or maybe haven't really found this thrill of being in the presence of God, then it is time to reclaim it. That's what the study is for. If you have not made, if you guys, if there's any of you have not made that confession of faith, you're kind of toying with the idea of Christianity. You, 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 you like to come to church for whatever reason, but you have not made that commitment to Christ yet. Then here it is. This is the truth. Unfiltered, uncompromised, unpopular. So what's your response? And it is my most sincere prayer that you do respond with faith. That you will receive this message of the truth. Think about this. The world will be over soon, whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not. We will all stand before God. We have to answer to the judge, the creator of the universe. Are you ready to pay for your own sins with your own life? Or would you accept the payment that God made for us? To receive the forgiveness of our sins. It's up to you guys. Let's pray.